Happy Heresies and Bienvenidos al Desierto del Real. If you are watching this on video and you see my Gen X mug, or if you're listening on audio and you don't hear some of that background music, maybe from Game of Thrones or some of my favorite soundtracks I like to play, you know this is a special show. And indeed it is. So, let's get down to business. Not to defeat the Huns, but maybe to bring in your inner Cenobite. I am sharing today, or in this eternal now, a piece of content from the Finding Hermes group. What is it? Well, it's, you might say, the biggest upgrade to Aeon Byte for subs. It's where you get two extra interactive pieces of content every month. One is a very engaging Q&A where I interact with you. The other is a presentation where either done by me or a special guest. And this time we have a special guest and I wanted to share with you. And that is James True, as always bringing some of his uh, excellent and latest research to the Kenoma. The title of this one is Pain as a Portal to God. What is it? Well, James uh, took us into the heart of why we suffer and the reason we desire ecstasy with the divine. Are our brains wired for pain? Or is it just an illusion we tell ourselves to feel real? You'll find out from both neuroscience and the mystic rituals of the ancients. So maybe uh, pain is part of Gnosis, but as always, James bring you stuff that will blow your mind away. And also, I want to take this opportunity to sort of promote uh, promote the Finding Hermes program. So please join if you can, because again, you get uh, two extra pieces of content every month, and we really dig deep and deep into Gnostic mysteries and other mystic traditions. Also want to mention, too, that if you are a non-sub, you will get the entire presentation by James. Uh, but if you are a sub, whether it's audio or video, you will get the Q&A we had afterwards. And it's pretty, I might say, essential because through the interaction of the questions from the audience, from the Finding Hermes group, uh, James was able to connect even more dots and fill in a few of the gaps. So uh, very amazing stuff if you are a sub. As I always say, please subscribe if you can. Lastly, uh, and I talked to James about this, this uh, show or this piece of content is a good time to announce Astronosis 3. And James will be there for sure. And Astronosis 3 is entitled Sophia and Simulated Realities. So you know it's going to be good with the content and the topics. In fact, uh, this year should be the best one yet. We will have a bigger audience. We will have amazing speakers, more speakers. Uh, improved workshops, panel discussions, and definitely some very cool social events where we can all interact, which is so important in this age of the Black Iron Prison and all those digital uh, illusions out there, if you would. So check it out in the show notes, Astronosis 3, August 9th and 10th at the Theosophical Society. Still working on uh, finalizing the guests, but as of now, the uh, well, the schedule looks amazing. Again, James will be there, but we also have committed Chris Knowles, Mitch Horowitz, Richard Smoley, David Block will be flying from Sweden, Jason Reza Giorgiani, and uh, yeah, again, there will be other speakers that will um, that will make this really an unforgettable event, like the last two, but probably even better. So that's really all I got for you. 
enough of my drivel. I uh, try to keep my uh, Hellraiser jokes to a minimum in the presentation and now. So, yes, let's get down to business, and thanks for being here. Oh, yeah, of course, write your own gospel, live your own myth, probably with a little pain, but so it is. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Thank you so much for giving me audience with your uh, with your wonderful crew. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, my name is James True. I'm an American philosopher and, and practicing sophist. Uh, I have no shame about calling my sophist. I believe we need more of me in the world. And I want to talk to you tonight about the technology of religious suffering. I'm assuming everyone can see my screen now and we're all good to go. If there's any audio problems, feel free to interrupt. I see something wrong or have a question, please feel free to interrupt. We're going to cover a lot of material tonight. I hope that I do it in a correct enough pace that is entertaining, but also will still leave you going, what do you mean by that for a few things? And, and I afterwards, I can explain how you can follow up more on my research on that part. <clears throat> Pain is information. That's all it is. Olympic networks use the informative language of pain to communicate. Pain is the only sensation we have, which might surprise many of you. Every other sense rides on top of pain's roadway. In computer programming language, we would call this assembly code. And at the very base root of a computer is an assembly language of pain. And DOS or the shell or Photoshop or Chrome, all those run on top of pain. <laughs> and pain is this binary signal that, that runs underneath. But in order to hear this without feeling I'm a nihilist or going out and killing yourself, please no one cut yourself now, I want you to know pain is information. It's information. And that we equate it with suffering because we are learning to read or decode or decompress information that's hard. The limbic universe is your entire world. And... I grew up in a time where the brain was said to not be a limbic organ, and that's no longer true. Most brain scientists recognize that the brain itself, the entirety of the brain, is in fact a limbic organ because this idea of a rational hypothetical really is impossible when you're dealing with the thalamus. You have at the base of this system a singular bridal chamber where all the decisions are made and that that bridal chamber is actually bribed and vetted by a series of chemicals, which you're about to find out really just come down to casino chips and that all those are just simply running on the cessation or the enlargement of pain to control the environment. Every sensory organ you have can be broken down to one of four light motion, chemical and temperature sensors. And all of these Inputs are going to be coming to you through a singular blip, a pulse. You're looking at a snapshot of every experience you've ever had or you've ever known on the screen right now. That every single thing that's ever happened to you looks like this. Everything. There's not one thing that doesn't. And this is a binary code. It's a binary code with a six-part harmony, that there are six, six ways in which these, this snapshot can be expressed, but all of them fit within this membrane potential of basically 100 millivolts. It's such a tiny, 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 tiny amount of electricity. It's almost inconceivable, even when we multiply it by a million. It really, we really have a trouble still feeling exactly what it is. It's just that subtle. Sitting on top of this pain, pro pain protocol, you have a, I'm sorry, sitting on top of this pain language, forgive me, you have a frequency protocol. And this frequency runs a language set that otherwise wouldn't be there. And you and I know this right now. We, we utilize HTTP all the time. When I tell you, hey, go to HTTP, you and I are using a secret code. And that secret code is running on top of the language set of binary. And when you and I input that secret code into Google or into our browser window or into a URL window, we get the exact same result. And that's what makes it a protocol language. It's a language that technically is intangible. It doesn't actually exist, 
unless there are two people that simply know how to decode it with each other. As you can see here in A, B, and C, all of these burst response, these would all be action potentials, neurons in your body, give that same signal that I showed you earlier. It's the same action potential. What's different is the frequency. Your heart has its own protocol. A heart is a separate entity from the brain. It has a living neural network called the myocardial wall. Not only that, it has its own language. It actually communicates in a different kind of action potential. It's the only place in your body where you'll find something speaking a different language. The language of the heart is more real than we realize. It actually has its own set of communication. So to really understand where we're going with this, I'm asking you to consider that every single form of sentience that you have is simply a grand symphony of pain. That from the moment you were born, you've been uh, routing all this information into a picture that you've rendered, a, a hallucination that you've created inside your substructure. And that hallucination has been taught to you through epigenetics, through culture, through religion, through archetypes. And that that entire system is actually built on pain. And one of the ways I want to prove that to you, because I'm hoping some of you are going to doubt this because you believe in happiness and you're going to die on this hill with me because I love you this much. Because underneath this, I want you to understand that a reptile has an emotional intelligence. But a reptile is a species of pain. Here's a list of every emotion that we can scientifically prove that a reptile has. Anxiety, distress, excitement, fear, frustration, pain, stress, and suffering. And if you notice something sinister about this list, they all come down to pain. And that the reptile is giving you a clue about how we're able to use this kind of input. I'm going to stop sharing screen for a sec because I want to take a moment to show you my face because I need you to know that I do not believe that suffering and pain are the same. I believe that pain is a brightness. And when you understand how your eyes work, you know that most of your eye is simply sensing brightness and that the first time you see something bright, oh, it's going to burn and that you would call that pain. And for years, you would go around insisting that God had installed pain holes in your face. And these pain holes, no matter where you turned, they had a different sensation of pain, and it drove you nuts, and it was torture. And one day, you'd wake up, and you'd notice that you were able to discern your environment through your pain holes. <laughs> and that these pain holes showed you more and more, and you started to realize this isn't pain. This is information. And so if I lose you from this point on, you've already been warned. I, I don't mind you embracing nihilism at this point, but I, I did try and save you. So let's jump back in. We're going to skip this for now, but I, I want it on your screen so you can read it later. It more has to do with medicine itself. We just don't have time to go into what medicine is. And the reason why is because first, I, something even more striking, I think, is that you have two time machines that have been created through this pain. And that these two time machines are a hindbrain and a forebrain. And this high brain we're going to call Epimetheus because it fits the mythology so well. It's so strikingly fitting of the figure of Epimetheus that I dare say the oracle mythology has just been telling you this the whole time. If you're not familiar with Epimetheus, a better way for you to grab this, since we don't have a lot of time to cover that mythology, is to think of your hindsight as your animal spirit. And many of us have this concept of an animal spirit, and I want to tell you that your animal spirit is not invulnerable, that your animal spirit leads you wrong all the time. And I think you should trust your animal spirit. I think you should listen to your animal spirit because the wrongness that your animal spirit leads you to is technically the right direction overall. But you're so clever, you're able to override this animal spirit, and you did that because you grew a whole other separate entity on the front of your brain, a tumor, if it will, 
And this tumor got so large that we had to call a whole other species, Homo sapiens. And then, and then that tumor again, 100,000 years later, I'm sorry, 10,000 years later, 20,000 years later, got even larger that the tumor tumored on top of itself. And we ended up with this sapien sapien, this two levels of awareness. And so Homo became aware, not just of himself, but he became aware of his own awareness. And he ended up with this weird thing that's a time machine. Because Prometheus is the time machine of the future. And Epimetheus is the time scene of the past. And this is your hindbrain and your forebrain. And so the back of your brain, this hindbrain, is constantly looking for all the pain that you've ever had. And every single time a new action potential comes in, it goes up to the scoreboard and it says, just like the stig, where on this is, is the worst pain? Is this the worst pain I've ever felt? And when it finds that slot, it stores it in the hall of pain. And it uses this hall of pain to dictate, hey, maybe I shouldn't do that again. Or, hey, maybe that's interesting. And so pain ends up being a constant measure of how much that fucking hurt. And that the record of how much that hurt is your animal spirit. It remembers that forever because it does not want you to get hurt because it's looking out for you. But it doesn't have the same kind of hypothetical grip of reality that you do. It doesn't have this ability to morph into the future because when you start to look at what your neocortex is doing, your neocortex's sole job is to flail your animal spirit. That the animal spirit is the crook, the pharaoh's crook. It's leading you to safety. But the forebrain, the Prometheus, is beating you senseless if you dare go for that cookie again. And that every single time that you try and stray away from, from your forebrain, this hypothetical egregore that's living in a tumor on top of a tumor in your head, you are exercising the ability to flog yourself, to deny yourself of the very chemicals that run your entire system. And the ability for you to do this required a lot of calories instantly that we had to negotiate this economy from such a, a giant, giant excess of blood and oxygen that we were able to create these tumors that created this time machine that's looking into the future. Prometheus only sees the future. It's never in the present. It's never in the moment. It, it would never dare to disrupt or disrespect itself that much. It doesn't have the... Uh, dirtiness that's required to live in the moment, which is what we're about to see. That in order to be in the moment, you are going to have to be pure reptile. Completely. Before we get there, though, this is sort of a summary of what I just said. And that the Oracle of Mythology is showcasing the different personalities inside of you, and some of you might have heard this through the idea of an ego and an id and a superego, and you're just simply looking at the three islands of Atlantis that are inside your brain. And Epimetheus is considered afterthought. It's the maker of animals, the spirit of temptation in mythology, and so you can see that expressed so clearly, so well in the hindbrain. And here Prometheus creates pain that, that it wasn't even there before. Literally creates a winter or a cold night or a starving moment that doesn't even exist. That creates that necessary forethought for you to gain those calories to create an even bigger tumor than you did before. So all this is our magic. All of these are hallucinations that we've been casting simply from the binary language of our pain. Iapetus is the one person I didn't mention, and we're about to get to him, but Iapetus is this reptile brain. It's the brain stem itself. And if you look at the mythology of, uh, of, of Iapetus, it fits this very, very well. Um, I wish I could go into it more. But we just have a lot to cover. One thing I will tell you, though, is that if you understand the story of Kronos, the brother of Kronos, you know that he's trapped in Tartarus. He's trapped in this darkness. <laughs> He's trapped in this place that has no light and no wind and no air and no breath. And, and, and you're wondering why can such a creature with so much abilities that can forge the strongest weapons that have ever been made, why is he choosing to be stuck in this place? And the reason why he's choosing to be stuck there is because he is stuck there. This is the eternal piercer. This is the word for man is one who pierces something. 
This is the needle that rides the record of the earth, your base reptile. And at the, at the head of Iapetus, his first child is his son, Atlas, his proud son, Atlas. And Atlas sits atop the throne of this brainstem, right? And Atlas is the oldest structure in your brain. Its daughter is the nymph Calypso, a word that literally means she who conceals. So the entire Tartarus idea is just living inside of you right now. Atlas holds no rational autonomy. You know this. Why is Atlas holding the world up? Why is he putting so much stress on himself so long? And this is why. Because look at what he's doing. He's literally holding up the entire globe, the hemispheres of your brain. The uh, Atlantic Ocean is derived from the word Sea of Atlas. And this name Atlantis mentioned in Plato's Timetus literally comes out to Atlas's island. And so I hope you can see that, that this Atlantis, it's the living brain. And when Plato described Atlantis, it was what? It was three separate islands surrounded by cranial spinal fluid. That this id, this ego, this super ego were these three islands of Atlantis. And living there was a kingdom of how many sons? Twelve. And those twelve would be your twelve cranial nerves. This is the oracle mythology urinating all over the floor. We, we cannot avoid this. It's so obvious what's happening here. Sentience, what we call sentience, is 100% sentimental. And I say that because I've shown you all of these limbic things that we do and that you would understand that it would be impossible for sentience to be any, anything else but a limbic response, which means that sentience is sentimental. All of sentience comes from your sentimentality. Your ability to find value in the world is exactly what makes you decide to spend the calories to what? To remember something that you develop sentiment for your child and you said, you know, I'm going to call you Og. And now I'm going to carry you in my head by the word Og. And my son's name is Og. And I'm going to remember that tomorrow and the next day. And on day four, I'm going to forget because I'm a caveman. I only have so many calories. And then I'm going to rename them. Then I'm going to remember it was Og. And then over decades and generations, we're going to get this right. And by God, we're going to have a social security card. That it's going to happen. That we're going to get there. And all that happened because we had sentimentality enough to remember. And the only way we could remember these things is by creating a warm-blooded computer to store this information. That the Sheol is the blood that flows in you itself. It has all that salt remembering all these things. You and I had this conversation a long time ago. And I'm going to say a cuss word, but it's just too funny. But a long time ago, you and I were sitting in a bar and we're like, hey, did you hear about that game? And, and I'm like, what game? And you're like, dude, there's this game where you wire your consciousness into 100 billion cattle prods. And you wake up with amnesia in this place. And these cattle prods are the only thing that moves you around. You have to learn how to eat and fuck and talk. And, and, and that's the game. And, 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 and when you die, you die. And then you remember everything. But until you do, you're just 100 billion cattle prods. And that's, that's who you are. That a company has developed a binary input to allow your consciousness to plug into 100 billion cattle prods and control them all. And this is your neurological network. Every single thing that you can do is going to be broken down to a binary router that's plugged into a system that's touching either a ligament or a tendon or a muscle or a, uh, all kinds of other stuff because I'm not a doctor. But that all these things that are occurring is literally the game that you're playing right now. And every single one of them runs off this information circuit called pain. I don't want you to believe me, especially because some of you don't know who I am yet. And I want you to check out this guy, Wolfram Schultz. And if you do a search for the video dopamine from movement via reward to rational choice, he will, he will tell you a lot of things that will blow your mind. And one of them is this, that there are no specific receptors for rewards. That the brain generates signals for something it makes up itself. But these rewards do not actually exist. They are made up by the brain and so are their signals. And this is fiat currency. This is the petrodollar. <laughs> 
that if you you if you had a system like this that the sentient agency that you call you a long time ago said we need to put everyone on a standard token so that we can share our resources because the gallbladder doesn't give a shit about the kidneys the kidneys really doesn't have any concept of what it's like to be an intestine and so let's create a casino where all of us can try and gamble and do what we do and that we just simply decide to use the same tokens so we can trade them in for privileges with each other. I swear that's what happened. <laughs> and if you caught my talk at Astronosis, I've been telling you that the Egyptian story of Osiris, right, which tells you that Osiris died and we're living inside of Osiris is true and that that I'm showing you that the economy, the crazy economy that we insist is horrible is brilliant it is brilliant the way fiat currency works that this system would be the only way that you could exchange resources inside your body is by having currency that's basically monopoly money and so when you were young you might have learned in school that dopamine is the thing that gives you pleasure and it's not dopamine gives you a token that you can go into the thalamus and say hi i'd like some dopamine please and the thalamus is going to look at the token and go Hey, this checks out. Yeah, give this guy a shitload of dopamine. And they bring it in trucks and that guy takes it back to his gallbladder and says, dude, we're going to eat good tonight. Why? Because the body is proud of what the gallbladder just did. And this would be the only way you could control this kind of economy, right? It's the only way this stuff's going to happen. None of this hurts. What I mean is there's a lot of deep meaning to the word hurts. I don't even have time to play with that tonight, but none of this hurts. Pain is frequency, not amplitude. When I was little, I thought that pain somehow got inside a little suitcase, right? And was carried from the toe up to the brain. When it got to the brain, the suitcase was open and it jumped out. It's like, Rah! and your brain's like, oh my God, fucking hurt, that hurts, that hurts, that hurts. And, and it's so much more profound than that. The, the truth is, here's, here's what every sensation that your body has is a five of 10. That that blip is a five or ten. There's no blip, blip, blip. Everything's just blip, blip. What is it? Blip. All your hair's on fire. Blip, blip, blip. All you really see the difference is is the frequency, but not the amplitude. And the frequency is not that much. It's actually not that much. It doesn't require that much simply because we have so many of these sensors, these diodes, throughout our body. Because of that, there's no need for any particular diode to send a signal that's stronger. In fact, if it did, it would short out the entire system, which is why everyone's agreed a long time ago to a protocol. This is why I said protocol. If you're not a computer geek, I'm sorry, it's probably not going to help. But if you are a computer geek, you're like, James, that's amazing. It's a really good analogy. So thank you. Pain is not inside our nerves, as I said. And then what actually happens is we render suffering. And we have to render suffering because we have to place it in the room. And we do this through the cerebellum, the back part of the brain, the, 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 the ass end of the brain. We do it there, which means we can't hack it. I'm sorry. You can't hack from there because the cerebellum is like hardwired. It's like, no, you can't do that. There's not a fuse box for that. Everything's spaghetti string. You're not, I mean, maybe someone could, but you, we're not, we're nowhere near that. We're not going to be there because you can hack your limbic system. Because you can lie to yourself, you can tell yourself stories, you can look at certain things, you can look at other things. Some will inspire you, some will take you down, you can uh, sabotage your career, you can uh, elevate your career, and that all these things would hack your system and change these things. But your cerebellum is locked, you're not going to be able to get in that code. So it has a built-in defense that says, I don't care how drunk you are, I'm going to breathe. Fuck you, dude, I'm breathing. Like, just it's, it's constantly, it doesn't care, it doesn't give you authority. Because you haven't earned it. You are looking at your grandfather that's 60,000 years old. It does not trust you. It remembers what it was like when it was your age. Fuck that noise, says the cerebellum. And so because of that, you end up with an economy that you inherited just like us. And just like us, when I was young and naive, oh, it's a deep state. We'll find this one little part. We'll fix this. Then the economy will be fine. No, 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 no. No, it doesn't work that way. We are dealing with Osiris here. This is too big to fix. It's perfect, the way that it's broken. 
So we find out pleasure is fiat currency, and it's even more profound than this, really. What I mean is, is that is that we don't just go around handing out currency, that your body had to create a casino. Your body had to create a casino. If you look at this graph on the right, this graph, uh, which is primarily by this, this uh, guy, Professor Schultz, uh, this graph might look kind of, uh, well, I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but I want you to look at what's happening between the positive reward predictions between zero and 1.2, specifically look around this 0.8. So what you're looking at is uh, a dopamine neuro, neurological signal. And the signal is, is directly uh, in line with utility, meaning that, that if you, if you asked a, a cell to do something and you gave it the dopamine credit for it and it responded, uh, the, the red would be what you would expect to happen. But that's not the case. <laughs> what happens is our body is constantly gambling with itself. That a long time ago, your body decided to biochemically create a living casino, a casino. And that the only way it was going to invoke your uh, attention Think about this. To invoke your attention is going to require you to have a thrill about something because the thrill is going to send the necessary jewels through your ion channels to say, I want more. And so these thrills are actually the dilation that's necessary before the dopamine even gets there. And these thrills come through through four major tokens, because if you only had one token, there would be no sense of collecting. You know how collectors are. Those massive nerds, they go to the deepest levels in the world to collect. And if you do not provide them with a beanie baby that there's only 17 of that have ever been made, they are not going to play. You can't just print the exact same number of beanie babies. It's not going to work. You need to have people find value in these tokens. And the only way you're going to convince the departments inside your body to have the value for these tokens is to separate them into four currencies and to suddenly just cut them off. And that's what this is. This graph right here is the result of what happens when you cut it off. That the, if your body learned a long time ago, this is so sick, but this is actually prisoner's gamble, but your body learned to start manipulating itself a long time ago because it said, hey, you did a great job. Here's dopamine. Hey, you did a great job. Here's dopamine. Hey, you did a great job. And it noticed that it wasn't getting enough work. And so it waited for the muscle to come back and say, did I do a good job? And, and the thalamus said, yes, but I'm not giving you dopamine. Next. And now the, the muscle's like, and you would think that the muscle would revolt. You would think that the muscle would retreat and say, I'm not playing. And it, it's, it's the exact opposite. It, it's, it's so much the opposite that the body invented four carnival games. <laughs> And I'm showing them to you right now. These are four different dopamine mechanisms for probability learning that your brain's trying to learn and it's being rewarded to learn the fastest through gambling. And so really quickly, I'm going to tell you about these. One is the fortune teller. It's where you're getting an extra amount of dopamine if you're able to predict an event that's never occurred before. That your thalamus goes, wow, gallbladder, that was a great guess. Holy, wow, that was amazing. And it gives you 10 times the credit that, that he thought he was going to get. And that invokes the gallbladder to start making three-point shots, right? He's starting to shoot for those things more. He's starting to, to start to, to take bigger guesses, to take bigger risks because he's hooked on the gambling. And this is why I'm talking this way because I want you to know this is what it feels like when you start to have these kinds of things. You have a coin toss where... If you're only getting rewarded, this also works on mice. I'm so sorry to tell you, but this also works on mites and rats with cocaine. But that if you give them a pellet 80% of the time, they do not respond as well as if you give them a pellet 50% of the time. And that for whatever reason, the utility ends up inverting where the rats start making decisions that are pro gambling and less utility, right? Utility would mean what is the total amount of pellets that I pulled out from playing with this lever? And that the rat decides, I don't care how many pellets I'm getting. This shit's fun. This is fun. Now, you and I would call that a gambling addiction. I have no problem calling it that. But I want you to, it, just for this talk, to consider that that is dilation. And that that act of dilation is exactly why we're here. And it's the only language that your cell would respond to to make it grow. To make it think that its universe should be bigger 
because this is so exciting. This is the Panther of the Aztec first son. Fuck, I can't tell you that right now. We'll have to talk. Okay, let me get back here. Um, so you have novelty roulette. This is when things are, are novel the first time you've learned something, but you get it right. Uh, and then you also have prediction rewards, which is similar to fortune telling, but it's a little bit more like like guess my weight game, <laughs> where 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 you can take your gamble at the thalamus and get more if you anticipate the right amount that's coming back. And and this anticipation is really crucial, which is we're about to get there. Before we do though, I want to remind you all that these casino chips are hackable. And that when you have an addiction that's so bad, you will simply start to lie to yourself and steal from the casino and either take chips that don't belong to you or invalidate chips that, that should discount other things because that's how hooked we are. And that the body uses that feedback to see how hooked we are and probably has to balance that out a little bit, probably back us off a little bit. Like, whoa, whoa, tiger, you need to take Sundays off, right? So I told you that the hypothalamus is this pleasure dome. And the word thalamus means bridal chamber. It's the one place where something would be conceived, right? So Penelope says, Odysseus, Odysseus, are you dead, Odysseus? And all these suitors are like, hey, babe, you want to hook up with me? And she's like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like he might come back. And Odysseus comes back and she doesn't recognize him. So she uses him a test and she goes, shall we move the bed? And Odysseus says, you can't be my wife, for you would know that I built this bed around the almond tree and that it's impossible for it to move, for the bed itself is rooted into the ground. And Penelope knew this is my husband. She knew the truth. The thalamus is the bedchamber for everything that you do. And that inside the thalamus, it looks just like a court because all these competing systems are manipulating and inserting propaganda through the hippocampal range to try and thwart everyone else in court so that they can have the favor of that hit, the golden chalice, right? So there's nothing honest about this economy. In fact, the economy is built on gambling <laughs> and mafia and deception. And it works. It works. And I hope that this is profound to you all. I hope that this gives you a tool set to actually look at the world and go, damn, why does this work? Or maybe for the first time, actually go, you know what? I think the world's working. I, fuck, I think the world's working here. And that without understanding the context of why all this wrong would somehow make it, make it right, it would be impossible to even consider this idea. And I'm telling you this now because we're about to get to the ecstasy stuff. And you're not going to be able to get the ecstasy stuff unless you're ready to embrace this. So from birth, we are the creature in the Black Lagoon. That these hundred billion cattle prods, right, are the only thing that you see. You're immersed in the blackest water you've ever seen and there's nowhere you can go. There's no sounds you can hear. You are completely encapsulated in nothingness with the exception of one singular thing, and it's called pain. <laughs> and in a way, your helplessness is a guardian angel. In a way, the fact that there's nothing you can do is the only thing that saves you because this forced surrender causes you to start to process the pain and those signals start to paint a picture of the world. And suddenly, you're building an entire universe off this thing that you thought was trying to kill you, that you thought was trying to attack you, that pain, well, all of us are dolphins of pain, and that we're echolocating this entire world, looking at how painful it is to look at something, to smell something, to hear something, to touch something, to get close to something. It's all coming down to that base source of pain. And when we start to define what pain is, we're going to find a really beautiful thing on the other side. So please stay with me. Our first breath is pain. It was. You don't remember it, but it was. It hurt like a bitch. You were like, what is happening? 
your first drink was pain. You're like, oh my God, what is this? Am I drowning? What is going on? Your first sight is pain. Your first sound of pain. Pain was your only compass. The only thing there for you that was showing you the way. And you fell in love with it as you should. One of the ways I can prove this is if you think about a baby's eyesight. That at the very, very prenatal stage, a baby, baby can only differentiate between light and darkness. And that at birth, baby's gotten a little bit better and he's a little bit higher, higher sensitive to color. He can discern contrast between black and white. And for the first time, he can start to discern red, which is a huge move. In three to four months, these color shades come in. He's got red and green distinctions. And of course, at five months, he's basically what we would consider almost fully colored. Primary colors are going to stick out more. You're going to have a hard time explaining the difference between puce and peach. And that that's simply because the pain is so loud in the retina that the opsins are trying to tell the brain what color this is, but the brain is just simply overloaded by the signal strength. And that through constant exposure of pain, I know that sounds horrible, but the only way baby can see is by constantly polluting itself with pain holes in its eyes until it just has no other choice but to look. It's the worst thing anyone could ever do for you. <laughs> and it saved your life. So let's get to the religious experience. That there's an irony to this idea of, oh God, and oh my God, and the orgasm itself is, is, is giving you a huge tell it's just declaring these three words many times, oh my God, and that this is a, a huge clue. The religious experience is an advanced form of pain reception. Ecstasy is the transmogrification of pain into bliss from an intimacy with pain's gnosis. Remember how we said pain is information. And to gnosticate that information would be to process it completely. To process it completely would be to find every part of it to be valuable. And by finding it valuable, you're willing to accept every part and that no melanin in your body is rejecting that information. We'll get to the melanin in a second. Ecstasy is the highest form of association. It is your favorite song you've ever heard times a trillion. You cannot stop dancing to it. We identify with music so perfectly that we become it. It becomes us. And this would be the same way with ecstasy and pain. And you know that now. I shouldn't even have to tell you this, but pain and music are the same thing. And that there's certain music that you find untenable. And there's certain music that touches you more than anyone's ever touched you before. And that the reason why there are differences is because really... You don't like a song, you associate with a song. Your plasma blends into the informational context of pain of that music. The pulse of that music, you say, identifies me. And because it identifies you, you feel a sense of eternity because that song seems to live forever. It lives outside of you, but you're able to hang yourself, to drape yourself along its cloth. And that becomes you, and it gives you this sense of eternity. And I think really this is at the heart of why pain and ecstasy are really the same thing. That really we're just simply identifying with something, and that something is source. Eternal life is the turn on. And that the only difference between climax and ecstasy, I'm going to tell you, is an octave. That ecstasy is an octave of climax. Climax is the anticipation of eternal life from a union of missing chromosomes, right? The woman's egg is missing a set of chromosomes. The man's sperm is missing a set of chromosomes. And when your body senses that the, 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 the lordosis is set in and she's arching her back and, and you have, have shut down your parasympathetic and you are now, I mean, you're sympathetic and you've entered into this ventral state and you are now moving and your urinary tract is shut down. And that in that moment that your body's going, Oh my God, guys are about to touch eternity. It's like, are you sure it's eternity? It's like, I'm telling you it's eternity. I'm I can smell her. I can smell her. And she's like, I can smell him. Oh my God, there's eternity. And that this is a climax. It's a climax. 
And the titillation that you feel when you're a teenager and you're listening to Journey Song at a, at a dance is you saying you can live forever and all you have to do is get in her pants. I don't mean to be crude, but I'm just telling you that that's, this is the source of this pain, right? It's the source of this signal. And we haven't even talked about prediction yet. I can't wait to get there. Before we do that, I want to I want to clue one more thing that's important. If you want to know why the religious experience is so strong, it really comes back to this casino that we talked about, about the four different games of chance. And I say that because if you add up what an ecstasy would do, it would be a triple dopamine payout in the thalamus, right? You've come to the thalamus and you've said, dude, I just scored. Look at this. Look, look out the eyes. Look at her. I just scored. And that that would be a triple trifecta because A, your chance, way, way to go, buddy. You took a chance, right? B, the novelty of it. James, you never score. What's going on, right? And then C, the utility. Oh my God, we're going to be able to live forever. And that, that produces this trifecta. And that, that trifecta has no choice but to reward you with tokens because otherwise the casino would never work. And all that has to be a gamble because it makes it so important to you to catch it this one time because otherwise it would just be an offer like a fiver post that says, hey, I need someone to pick me up in three days. You're never going to get a ride that way. But if you tell someone, I need someone to pick me up in three days, but one of you is going to get a million dollars, maybe. And you're going to be having Ubers lined up around the block, right? So we understand the power of what this does. I think the best way to really illustrate this point is if you ask yourself, at what point does a tickle become an assault? That there is a place that you have when you're with your brother or with your loved one and you're tickling each other and the, and you start to say okay stop and, and and there's a point where you can't stop but the and the the laughter is stopped and it's no longer something fun you're now having a lot of trouble with it and guess what the signal's the same it's the exact same signal and it proves that you're hallucinating you're hallucinating that feeling because if you could open up the little nut that travels up your neurons and look inside, there's not a little creature going pain, nor is there one going laughter. It's simply input and your hallucination, your three-tiered hallucinary Atlantis paints a world that best reflects what this could mean from a utilitarian standpoint. This is the essence of pragmatism, right? We define our cosmology not by what it is, but by what it works. And this is at the heart of what we have to do as Osiris. We're literally born in the womb. If you consider that, it kind of shows you how eyesight would mean nothing. Hearing would mean nothing. Smell would mean nothing. Meanwhile, if we hallucinate, we can go ahead and build our entire cosmology right there. We can build all the brain structure we need because we're hallucinating the whole thing. We don't even need to see. So your world is being built whether or not your eyes are exposed to the world or not. It's being built because your hallucinations are, are creating a pain template a texture that shows where all the pain is in the world. There's a Dr. Michael Levin. I can't talk about it right now, but I could show you where in a lab you can actually create an eyeball on the back of a newt and that that eyeball, once it's in place, will automatically seek out the spinal column and route a channel into it and start to feed it information. And the moment that the thalamus reads, oh my God, we got an eye on our butt cheek. It's going to go reward that eye. I love this. I love looking out of my butt cheek and that that's how the body works. So all of this is the negotiation of pain. Now let's talk about God. This is a picture of God. I took it with a special lens. And that pain is the drum we stretch to listen to God's source. His divine radiation melts your face off and we have biblical references to prove it. He is every ray streamed at once. He is the microwave, the infrared, the ultraviolet, the X-ray, and the gamma. He is the alpha and the omega hertz. And hertz is such a perfect word. God hurts. Your face would melt in his presence. His righteousness occupies every spectrum. And it's not a coincidence that you can only exist in the tiniest rainbow sliver in between. And that the moment that you try and perceive too low into infrared or too much into ultraviolet, you die. <laughs> you die in the face of truth, of source. But we can get better. 
and that we've learned to see colors, right? The exact same way, because we were able to expose ourselves to pain and by exposing ourselves through pain, our visible spectrum grew. And instead of us just being able to see red, now we're all the way up now where we're literally having arguments right now today, I'm happy to say, between violet and purple and teal, what's going on here, and aquamarine, that, that we're building another color that's coming out of the factory because our mandala has grown. God is divine radiation. It would be just the same to say radiation or radiance. And that you're looking at Akhenaten and Nefertiti nursing from the divine radiation of the disk of source. And they're showing you the different bandwidths, whether they meant to do that intentionally or not. They're showing you the different bandwidths that, bandwidths that all of us live on. There are octaves from ecstasy to climax. And there are octaves from sentience to kind of sentient to almost sentient to legally not sentient and you know them well and i could show you the trellis of slavery and show you from cannibal to surf to slave to uh blue collar worker to white collar worker to master to to all these different levels you're just looking at people that are able to discern source more than others and that gives them an advantage and that advantage allows them to own more of a spectrum, which just gives them more resources as a result. So pain is a self-profiting motivation that the world we have rewards us for exposing ourselves to pain. And if you look at the Osiren model, that would mean that inside your body right now, the thalamus is rewarding all of your departments for exposing themselves to more than they normally would. And it's saying, thank you. This is the, the dilation of your body. Your body's growing uh, more sentient and it's doing that through pain. Pain. Oh, James, you're a oh, pain. Visio beatifica. Every saint that we have qualifies for the visio beatifica. This Latin word basically means that they enjoy a direct communication with God. And although it doesn't necessarily say face to face, I want you just to picture that a saint can look right in the face of God and not have his face melt off. And that in order for the saint to gain that, he was going to have to go through some serious training. And the foreshadowing should be upon you now because I've just told you that we see more source with pain and sure enough, it works that way. And before we get there really quick, here's some Bible verses you cannot see my face, for no man may see me and live. Uh, no one has seen God. It is God's only Son who is close to the Father, who's made him known. And when glory passed by, this is my favorite, I will put you in the cleft of a rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. This is a, a uh, uranium P35, P2, whatever, right? You know, like this is like a, a radioactive uh, Lord. And the radioactivity would completely fit with this model, wouldn't it? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. We just didn't understand it back then, right? And so now we understand Jesus. He's asking God, are we there yet? And God's like, not yet, man. You, you, you can suffer some more. Come on, I know you can do this, Jesus. I know you can. I know you can find more pain in you. And I don't even mean that disrespectfully, but... Uh, most of the pagan Catholicism, one of my favorite things is it's it's just beautiful because they have no choice. They can't let go of it because it's tradition. So it's just all there for all of us to see and that they have these instruments of pain. From the hair shirt to the, uh, forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, Cecilio, uh, th these, these instruments that are used to pierce the thighs and the skin and, and to make you feel uncomfortable is the same kind of pain technology we've been talking about. And we glorify this. There are 26 instruments of the passion that are gilded in gold. It's literally like a collection of torture devices. It's like going into an adult store and like going to the back. You literally have to find the stuff behind a curtain. It's like, yeah, you got the good stuff. Oh, we got the good stuff. Yeah, we got the penitent, penitent thief 
Uh, we got Dismas, we got the ladder, we got Sponge on Reed, we got a hammer and angels, we got the cock, the star, the pincers, the ladder, the spear. They thought of everything. They they thought of it. That's just page one. We got a chalice, a torch, the lantern, the sword, the flagellum, the pillar of fl flagellation, the pillar of flagellation. None, 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 right? It, it's the Veronica's veil, the 30 pieces of silver, maybe dice, the rod scepter, hand was struck Christ, the torch, the pitcher, even the vinegar is there. But these aren't the, these, this is kid stuff. This is kid stuff compared to the big prize, the arm of Christie, the crown of thorns. This archetype represents the deepest forms of pain you can have. And I want you to know that I understand this. No, I do not mean to imply that, that I've suffered like Christ has. I haven't, but I'm telling you, when you look at the symbolism of what this means, Wow, it hurts. Because the people that are torturing you are putting a crown on your head. And when they're allowed to put a crown on your head while they torture you, it feels like they are treating you nice. And it ends up discounting every single feeling you could possibly try and get from another person's face who's doing this to you with all 26 of these instruments. And the entire time insisting that they're being nice to you. It is a special kind of hell. And I'm proud to say that I've had maybe 0.0001% of what, what Jesus must have had. And boy, that is a good one. It's the Sundance. And I, I hope this doesn't sound disrespectful. I, I, I need you to know something, though. And it just happens to be that I chose the Sundance to say it. This is not a characteristic of the Sundance. It's a characteristic of humanity. A hundred years ago, we were piercing ourselves with the talons of eagles and attaching those to strings and hanging ourselves from trees. And that today we are posing for pictures and we're holding strings that happen to be attached to a tree. And that for three days now, you can go and practice the Sundance. And instead of you piercing yourself, and people do pierce themselves. This is why I'm apologizing. I don't mean to disrespect this ritual, but I just want you to know how we've changed. That initially, everyone would pierce, or, or much more, I should say. And that now in today's world, we've kind of caramelized the ritual. And certainly the fact that it was illegal for so long, it's now legal now. But that, that certainly has something to do with it. But I promise you, it's not just that. That when you look at every ritual that's been done in the past, it was so much more severe than it is now. And that our society tends to calm things simply because of why? Remember we talked about the novelty? Because the novelty wore off. Because the first time that you and I walk into a village and Doug's over there hanging from freaking eagle talons from a tree, we are impressed. We are impressed. We're like, my God, Doug, that is impressive. The second time, we're like, holy shit, Doug, you're going for more. Wow, what a dude. The seventh time, the ninth time, we're like, eh, there's Doug doing his thing. And then eventually these rituals would wear out the same way a fad diet wears out. And it just proves what's working here. The technology of belief is the true thing that's causing the fad diet to work. The technology of belief is truly the thing that's causing the Sundance ritual to work. And so now... When you look at this, I, I just want you to know that it's every ritual. It's not the Sundance. It's every ritual has been normalized and softened over the years. And I'm priming you for that because you're about to see one that you may have missed. There's a reason baptisms traditionally require several men to be there. There's a reason for that. We need, we need six strong men. What for? We're going to go baptize Roger. Well, si yeah, we need six. Well, don't you just, you know, sprinkle, sprinkle water on Roger's head? It's like, no, that's not what's happening. Get in the boat, get in the truck. Roger's going to get baptized today. There's a reason why the baptisms drew so many witnesses. And that if you and I were to go to the park and I was to sprinkle some, here's some, here's some holy water, I, I think, that no one's going to watch. No one's going to find that impressive. Okay. <laughs> There's a reason that the Sadducees and the Pharisees found this practice of John the Baptist so concerning. There's a reason why it made history. 
And I want you to take this sun dance that I just told you about and stretch it the same way that we would stretch baptism across history and start to look at what's really happening, that the crossing of the arms is a link to the near-death experience. And that the best post to, for Roger to hold when six guys, and Roger's a big guy, dude hung himself from Eagle Talents just last year, okay? And now he's ready for something else. And he said, hey, dudes, I want you to come hold my ass underwater until I almost die and then bring me back up. And they're doing the math. They're like, well, last time it took three days for you to hang in Eagle's Town. This is going to take seven minutes. Roger, I'm going to do this for you. This sounds like fun. You want to meet Sunday? Okay, I'll bring a lunch. Waterboarding is a simulating drowning in a controlled environment. It works as a form of torture because it dilates the person so much to where they enter into a state of life or death. And it becomes easier to extract information in that state. Waterboarding works because the subject thinks they're dying. Baptism works because the subject thinks they are dying. And here's a huge lesson because Roger going down to the river Jordan and being waterboarded has a completely different effect over Roger's psyche than Roger being taken to Guantanamo Bay and waterboarded against his will. Exact same act. Everything's the same. In fact, in Guantanamo, the water is room temperature. So it's, it's better. Technically, it's better. <laughs> but it's different. It's different. Why? Because you and I hallucinate what the information means. We decide what's pain. We decide what's pleasure. That's why sex will hurt and it will feel good. That's why ecstasy will hurt and it will feel good. That's why the saddest, most cobalt blue song you've ever heard that makes you cry feels so fucking good. It feels so good. You're like, damn, I am sad. Man, I am so sad from this. It's amazing, right? Because you were dilated. You were not here to be happy. You were here to be dilated. My friends, the beatings will continue until dilation improves. This is the Ashura Festival. It's certainly not the entirety of that. So please do not think that Ashura simply means dudes to go around beating themselves. But uh, just like the Sundance, you have this same ritual in effect where people are trying to see deeper into the source of God and using the shortcut of pain to get there. Dilation is a portal to God. Fear is the measure of one's worthiness to enter. You and I have a lot more at stake now. These guys on the left, these dudes are insane. They are insane. These guys do this ritual every year. It's like 120 feet off the ground. They climb up to the top. They represent the four different directions. It's a Mesoamerican ritual. I say that broadly because it's not just Aztec. There's a lot of different cultures that for whatever reason practice the same thing. The only difference is sometimes it's five instead of four. And, and when I say the number, I mean, they're, they're called flyers. <laughs> These dudes are flyers. And the, their entire job was to climb up. And you might be wondering, well, I'm sure they were afraid they're going to fall. It's like, it's actually worse because they were afraid they were going to fall too early. Because there's a culmination in this ritual where they actually fall. <laughs> they, they actually jump off the pole. And you and I don't see that now. When we watch this reenacted, it is still scary. It is still life-threatening. But these guys are not jumping off that pole. They're unwinding themselves slowly in a safety harness. And even that they've had to stop doing because even that was killing them. That a long time ago, these rituals involved death. That death was not something that you and I have the same approach to. I can't go too deep into this. But if you want to consider one example that I think proves this, it's the flower wars. That for maybe 100 years, I don't know the exact dates, but for maybe about 100 years, that there were factions in, in, in current day, in, in back then Mexico, in, in Mexica territory, Nahuatl land, that were having a polite war with each other. A polite war where it was fisticuffs. I call fisticuffs on you. And, and, and they would go out at night and they would capture the flag with each other. And it was almost like tag. It was certainly more brutal than that. But I, I want, in order for you to understand this, I need you to picture it like tag. 
because that's really how it worked. And they, they weren't going out killing people in foreign lands. They were going out and they were subduing them and they were convincing them, I am your master now, you're coming with me, and that that person, like a beast of burden, would follow. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and erased the history of America. And, and five years later, at the Templo Mayor, probably 80,000 people were killed in three days to celebrate the opening of a temple. Probably 80,000. I think people are going to, oh, it's not 80. They're just exaggerating because of racism. No, no, I think that they're not exaggerating because of racism. Honestly, I think it's the opposite. I think that this is a beautiful thing because it's showing you what consciousness was. I don't think that this was necessarily specific to Mesoamerica. It's just because of the ritual. We, we tend to forget that we were doing the same thing, that we were just, hey, can you bring that ship over here? Yeah, take every poor person who's stupid enough to, to walk over here and put them on the ship and take that ship far away and just fucking dump it. I, I don't fucking care. It's no different. And I need you to understand, not that it was cruel back then. I need you to understand why it worked. Why did 80,000 people voluntarily... Now, look, the first guy, I get it. He didn't know what was happening, right? Oh, it's a party? Oh, you want me to go up the top? Great, you know? Maybe second guy, right? Oh, that was an accident, I'm sure. That guy probably said something rude, you know, didn't, didn't respect our culture, you know, culture appropriation, stuff like that, right? Third guy, but come on. Like, after about 3,000, you're really starting to realize this is a beast of burden. You understand? You're, you're, you're leading someone into the slaughterhouse who's not actually stopping and when you understand the concept of the aztec sun you're looking at a period where 52 years was about the equivalent of what their consciousness could hold in their memory and that the reason why the new fire ceremony was resetting all their hearths and, and rebuilding their culture literally from the ground up every dish every towel every sheet every hearth in your home had to be extinguished for seven days. You're living in darkness with no electricity. Why? Because your consciousness cannot fucking fill it. You have to hit empty trash. Your desktop is not that big because you do not have enough calories. And back then, I believe that the sacrifice, the idea of dying, wasn't that big of a deal. It just wasn't, it didn't carry the same weight as it does now, precisely because we lacked self-worth that there's an octave of climax and there's an octave of ecstasy. And you're only going to discover the octave of ecstasy after you've fucked enough to wear off the novelty of climax. And that only once that's gone, can you start to look at these other octaves and see. So please imagine that these people that we're talking about are nothing like you and me, nothing like it. And it gives you an honesty that you and I don't have because the shameful behavior that we see, they don't, which means they record it, <laughs> which means we get to see it. And this is the Oracle mythology. It's really giving us the truth. You know, Rasputin is really famous for being a dude that's just like, you know, today I'm going to crush my nuts in this vice and wear it for six days and eat breakfast. And I want you to know I hate salsa on my eggs, but I'm going to have it anyway. And that he saw the same thing. And so many people were so addicted to Rasputin because he had that same fucking vision. Look at his eyes, Loco. He's like, I see things. And he saw Source and people knew it and they wanted it. They wanted it bad. This hasn't changed. This is one pug life. I'm going to hit play. I'm, I'm, it, it, I don't expect a sound to come through. I'm hoping it won't because you don't need to. But this is the guy in Canada. His name's one pug life. And this is him jumping uh, an RV. And that crash right there, which is just a replay, uh, put him in the hospital and, and he's forever handicapped. And he has 266,000 subscribers now. And that one pug life traded a permanent disability for 38.5 views per day. Right. If you do the math, because of this, he now gets 38 and a half people that every single day come up to him and say, One Pug Live. And I don't think that he's an anomaly. 
I think that One Pug Life is giving you an opportunity to kind of see really what's at the heart of who we are. We we are more willing to play with pain than we're ever, ever going to admit. Because pain, pain opens things like valor. And One Pug Life can prove that. 266 people would not have hit a button if he would not have handicapped himself like this. And that we are the ones at Templo Mayor that are saying, no, go up to the top. That we're the ones. It's literally what that mean, name means, the Temple of Authority, Mayo, the Temple of Authority. And that this guy is, still has a show. He can't stop now. How could you stop now? You can't stop. And that he brings that back to the village. And just like Roger comes back, because Roger is now done with the eagle talons, but now he's drowning himself, that we're still doing the same thing. What's different is we're more complex now. And because we're more complex now, we have the ability to cover our ass cheeks when we do it. That we're not able to embarrass ourselves so much. We're not able to, when I say embarrass, I'm sorry, I'm going to take that back. We're not able to show the raw truth, the naked truth of what we're really doing. Because if we were, we would feel embarrassment from it. I do not think it's actually embarrassing. I just want to clarify that. I think that we built the the system around it that's embarrassing. To me, it's 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 kind of embarrassing how we all choose to die right now. I think it's kind of disgusting, personally. And we, we have a taboo against even giving you the ability to end your own life. And so many people that I think would have actually ended their life in a pretty cool kick-ass way don't get to do that because society has said, please don't. Please don't remind me that you might have power to remove or to control your own life. So we're still seeing the same things. And I think it's good. I really think that we're on the right track. Childbirth is a perfect example. Fuck, that's got to hurt. Look at her face. That has got to hurt. <laughs> it's just got to. But it's not just that. When can we admit as a species that we came here for pain? If you watch Invisible People, which is a show about homeless people, and they just kind of interview these different people, and I just, I can't help it. I find it fascinating to just hear their stories. I feel like I'm helping in some way. <laughs> not that I am, but it feels that way. And almost every single guy that's on that show tells you a story about how he got a divorce. It's, it starts with, I got a divorce and now he's living on the street and certainly a ton of things happen between, but over 50% of the marriage is in a divorce. And I'm saying, I think that's maybe, maybe okay. I think maybe part of why we're here is to break ourselves over and over again, but we can't just voluntarily break ourselves. We're too sophisticated. So we have to create drama. And if we can break ourselves and get laid in the same time, divorce is kind of brilliant. It's really brilliant if you think about it. It's going to cost you a lot, but hey, women are worth it. And it's not just that, right? We feel rejected by God. We feel rejected by our family. We feel rejected by our finances, our friends, our health, our intelligence, justice system, our own looks, our own appearance, our progress at work. But most importantly, we reject ourselves. Reject ourselves so much. And then we're constantly having to rebuild ourselves after rejecting ourselves, that we're cursing ourselves out one day and we're never apologizing ever. We're insisting it doesn't matter, which is a crown of thorns. Like we do that to ourselves, but we would never, ever, ever compare ourselves to one who would suffer like Christ because none of us are allowed to suffer and profit from it. Because if we could, we'd see more source, which I think breaks down the real reason why we have so much inflammation. It's not that we fear source. It's that we don't want to see source. Oh, James, don't say that. It's true. We do not want to see source. And so we inflame ourselves from seeing source because quite frankly, we like to play in the atheism. The atheism gives you a very special privacy from God and you can play with yourself. You can diddle yourself. You can shed on other people. You can treat people horribly. You can treat yourself horribly. And it'd be the only way you could do that is if you had denial of the righteousness of God. And dilation is the great work. It's this constant thing that's always happening. It's always leading us to this place. Your consciousness has an aperture. And I really mean this. It's not just an analogy. I really think it's a real bona fide thing. And it's probably somewhere around your amygdala, but I don't like saying that. It's so much more complex than that. Um, 
But, it, but if you don't know what aperture is, it's it's an opening that's going to allow a certain amount of light in. And of course, that's used with f-stops, so it, it doesn't always fit with the camera. But the, the essence is, is that there's a certain amount of area that you can focus on. That the wider your aperture is, you have a broader range of ability to focus in a certain area. And so the more pain that you take in, the wider your aperture would go. The more your cervix of consciousness would open and dilate and you would give birth to source energy coming into you and reverberating off your drum that your consciousness is probably best understood as just a giant drum skin stretched across this delicate cross of bones. And that those things are just listening to the reverberations of the world. But it's okay because sometimes those reverberations are too big and you need to be able to turn them off. And how do you turn off your aperture? Because you can't close your eyes, but you can squeeze your aperture like a sphincter, like a butthole. You can squeeze it closed. And the way we do that is with melanin, that the body has two forms of controlling your aperture consciousness. One is the, the gas, which is the dopamine, and the other is the break, which is the melanin. Mice cannot uh, see without melanin, nor can you and I, I mean, without dopamine, forgive me, mice cannot see without dopamine, nor can you and I, we cannot hear without dopamine. And inside your ears, even where the light doesn't shine, there are melanocytes, this special uh, membrane that secretes melanin. And melanin, as you know, hopefully know, absorbs electrical information. It absorbs source, which means there's a chemical in your body that's directly there to blot out truth from you so it doesn't touch your skin and that that happens through this concept called melanin on the right is a close-up of your rods and your eye and if you're looking at this the top excuse me the top is your retinal wall and that the top is actually where the light sensors are and so your eye receptors are shoved, the light bulbs in your eye receptors are shoved into the skin of your eye. They don't stick straight out. They're actually backwards. They're shoved into the skin of the eye and wrapping around the skin of every single one of those light bulbs is an RPE cell. What is the RPE cell? It's a membrane that secretes melanin. It's a dark screen. That your eyes have the ability to saturate darkness around every single input that you read and that, that we do not know what exactly causes the secretion of melanin, but also we know that there are efferent uh, nerves in the eyes, which means that there is a pathway of information leading into the eyes, that the eyes are not simply wired to go out back into the occipital lobe, that there is a direct route from the thalamus. It's actually the hypothalamus through this amygdala that goes into the retina and somehow does something, but none of us know why. And I'm going to tell you, James True is guessing, pure speculation, but it's probably telling you when to secrete melanin because you've seen something that's quite simply just too much. And that if you didn't have this, you'd faint. If you didn't have this, the headlights from a creature you've never seen would freeze you in the road and you just quite simply have too much importance to do to have that much control. So you have this governor that automatically pulls an emergency brake the second it senses too much tension in your body, the second it, it senses the inflammation, it secretes melanin, it absorbs reality around you, and it makes you feel better. And this is how you negotiate pain through this break of melanin. There's another picture of the same thing. Melanin is not here to color your skin so you can call each other racist. This is literally the most retarded idea I've ever heard. Melanin is here to absorb information. It is literally a black hole. There are people that now have a cosmological theory that melanin exists in deep space. And it, this is like not even a crazy kooky theory. That there's something massively amazing about this chemical and its ability to black hole all light. And it gives no heat. It actually converts it into energy and your body uses it as fuel. That your ignorance is a fuel. It is probably the oil that we see in the ground. That the fuel that we're denying right now in our world is simply melanin, excreted from Osiris, a natural chemical that's here to shade us from too much source. And it's interesting that we're living, someone's going to see this, but we're living in this place where we're shaming oil because we're saying that it's blocking out the sun. And that's because it is.
This is happening on a cosmological level inside the body of Osiris. And if you want to know where that is, it's you. It's right now, it's you. I am inside your body. I'm just one cell. Some of you are going to probably call me, you know, the 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 uh, a cell around the butt cheek, you know, but I'm I'm a shoulder cell. I'm a good shiny shoulder cell. It just depends on how you feel about me. But all of us are represented inside of each other's body. That's why we know each other. The truth is always in the room. A, a big point of my last talk at Astronosis. Hey, we're done. We're done. Um, good. I, I hope that wasn't too much. I just at least wanted to to get that out. I'm happy to do any discussion if there is. I was hoping I would have even more, but uh, this is sort of like the end of what I just kind of wanted to wanted to throw at you today. So thank you so much for listening. Appreciate it. Oh, my God.